It's a pleasure being here today with all of you. Uh, I would like to first thank uh, NHS Scotland and Jason for inviting me to share our model of healthcare uh, and it's eye care which we do. So I'm just going to share with you our experience of establishing a successful organizational approach to quality and also safety. So way back, 40 years back, we started with 11 bits in a small town called Madurai. And now we have five tertiary eye care centers across the state of Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry, six secondary care centers doing cataract and referring subspeciality to the nearest tertiary care center. And we have some outpatient centers in cities where the hospital is a little far away. And then we have this network of primary eye care centers called vision centers in 59 locations. On an average, we see close to 13,000 outpatients. We do 1,500 surgeries every day. We do five to six outreach eye camps where we go to the field and then examine the patients and transport them to the surgery. And being a teaching and a training institute, we train a lot of residents in ophthalmology and also technicians who help the ophthalmologist to do eye care. So just to understand, this is all in south of India, in the state of Tamil Nadu. We are located, all the centers of Aravind, except for the one in Pondicherry where I come from. It's an union territory, which is a kind of separate state, uh, not geographically. In last academic year, 3.5 million outpatients, 400,000 surgeries, including a few laser procedures, almost half a million prescription glasses, and all of them are dispensed. And mostly, if you see, 50% of our services are either free or steeply subsidized. Just give you an overview of over the inception for the last 40 years, we have been gradually growing in our outpatient to reach almost 3.5 million outpatients every year. And uh, we have done close to 5.5 million surgeries, which equals to 400,000 in the last few years. The main backbone is through our community outreach or the eye camps which we do. We do close to 2,500 eye camps through which we see half a million patients and we bring in 100,000 cataracts through these eye camps. Just to give you an overview of the kind of medical team working, full-time ophthalmologists, 187 people, a lot of people in training, and uh, the MLOP which you see there is the mid-level ophthalmic personnel or the trained technicians and nurses who help the ophthalmologist to do the eye care. We have a lot of people undergoing training under them and uh, equal number of support staff and research facility. So the uh, setting a right balance is very important for us to have this excellence in operation because we are, have a good number of demand generating systems to bring in patients, the volume inside. So we need to be highly productive at the same time to bring in this volume and to encourage a lot of people to come into our system, we'll have to focus on clinical quality also. So this overall gives a good patient experience. And we strongly believe that in eye care, we are thinking about vision and clinical outcomes, but for us, I think preserving dignity and building a trust with the patients is more important for quality. We closely follow this way of uh, the quality uh, paradigm. Uh, developed by the IOM, or the Institute of Medicine, of which you know, the backbone is patient safety, followed by patient-centeredness, effectiveness, efficiency, being timely in whatever care we give, and more importantly, we give a lot of importance to equity of care, whether the patient can afford, not afford, don't matter for us. We wanted to give a equity of care, clinical care and surgical care, to everyone who approached our system. So how do we hardwire this quality uh, into the blood? These are the different dimensions which I would be covering on. Uh, to start with, mission and values is the organizational DNV, DNA for us. And Dr. Venkat Swami, who founded this organization, had a very clear vision in his mind 40 years back when he started. He said, we're going to eliminate needless blindness by providing a high quality, high volume, and a compassionate eye care to all. So we work towards this goal with a very strong value system. And over the years, we have developed a very good delivery system to take this process uh, forward. And somewhere down the line, we keep 
incrementally innovating towards it, uh, either in the form of systems or in uh, uh, innovations which, break, which, which, which bring in a big change in the way we deliver eye care. So the commitment of leadership is, is very important. We have uh, uh, very committed uh, founders who are leading the organization, and there is an, always an attitude for perfection, and uh, kind of we create a culture of quality in the organization. So just to uh, take an overview of what happens in uh, patient empowerment, you know, they, we, we give a kind of an informed decision making. We are very transparent in uh, whatever we have in, in the form of either the treatment which is offered or the charges towards the treatment. And we have clinical protocols and staff are allotted, are not influenced by the patient status. Somebody who's posted in the paying side would, would be on the free side the next month. Same way the, the surgeon may be swapped in their surgical schedule also. And the choice of treatment like this lies on the patient. So you have a transparent uh, pricing there, depending upon what room you choose or what lens you choose, your prices may change, but uh, uh, it, it is so transparent whatever we charge for them. And to minimize the patient cost, what we do is we try to complete all the investigations in a single visit for somebody with a cataract who comes in the day before the surgery, all the investigations are repeated, I mean, are completed, and if he's ready for surgery, he undergoes the surgery next day, and the third day he is discharged and sent home. And we have no appointments or waiting list for any procedure, including complex vitreoretinal and glaucoma procedures, so that we, uh, we eliminate unnecessary waiting time and also unnecessary tests being done on them, and we minimize the length of post-operative stay if needed. And the cost of access, the lost wages and incidental expenses can be significant you know, if we ask them to come again and again for uh, follow-up or uh, uh, schedule an appointment for surgery. So uh, we try to save a lot of money on the patient's side. For ensuring uh, compliance, you know, we have uh, several mechanisms, but this is one thing which I would like to share with you. We have something called the E1, E2 system, wherein in any uh, department, they would have something like this to see that the patients are categorized for follow-up, and depending upon the need for follow-up, uh, for somebody like an endophthalmitis, which needs an emergency care, they would make sure the patient is admitted the same day or he comes for the treatment within 24 hours uh, if he needs a treatment, if he needs an hospitalization and things like that. And the priority is given for the counseling, which is done by a group of girls called the counselors. And post-operative instructions are also given by them. And the care is, uh, and the patients are also closely followed up when they come back for follow-up. So just you are just seeing a, a video of the counseling which happens with our ICAM patients where these people are coming from rural areas and they are not literate on the medical side. So every medication is very clearly shown to them with the color of the medicine and how they should apply so that they don't miss any medications for uh, the next 30, 40 days. And this is very, very important to have. You have the right person to do the right job because we train a lot of these uh, girls from schools into, uh, into this mid-level ophthalmic personnel, but we try to uh, bring in a lot of uh, uh, process in, in recruiting them. So we, we do a rigorous uh, procedure to recruit these school girls who are from the rural and semi-urban areas. They undergo several tests, and then they are interviewed with their parents for uh, selecting. So we basically look into their family values, the way they, uh, they've grown up with the family, you know, whether they have siblings and things like that. And uh, they do a lot of, after the recruitment, they do a lot of hands-on training, and they learn everything by doing. Their theory classes would be only 10 or 15 percent, almost 80 to 85 percent, they'll be on the field helping their senior nurses and learning on the field. And we do a very constant skill assessment for them, and we have a kind of manual of procedures, what they should follow for each and every test. Like for example, you have to measure the pressure, how do you do it, how do you clean the eyes, and things like that. So they follow this during the training period and they master the particular skill set which they are supposed to do after the training. And there is a kind of continuous improvement over the for the training for them, and uh, this adds a lot of value to the care. So every year like this, we select 500 plus girls in across all of our five major hospitals, and we train them to assist the ophthalmologist. So basically, this uh, 
uh, recruitment, we, we look into their values more than the skill. I mean, we strongly believe that we can impart skill to them after we recruit them. And uh, most of our the workforce, almost 60% of the workforce are these mid-level ophthalmic personnel. And they perform most of the routine clinical tasks. So they allow the doctors to do what they are best. For example, diagnosis and surgery. Uh, like in an operating room, they would, they would drape the patient, prepare the patient for the surgery so that the op ophthalmologist's time is optimally utilized. So this results in higher quality and productivity, and it also lowers the cost back at home. So this is how we balance. We try to have kind of a ratio, like for every ophthalmologist, there would be five paramedical staff and four support staff. The support staff meaning the girls who are counseling the patients, catering team, housekeeping team, and the other security team. So each and every ophthalmologist will be like a ratio of one is to five, especially if you see in an operating room. Uh, uh, maybe I'll show you a video quickly when it runs. It helps the clinician really to focus on the critical areas like decision making, counseling, and surgery. And uh, most of the time, the patients spend with the paramedics in any system. So uh, here again, no, they, they spend a lot of time with them in uh, discussing with them the treatment protocols and also about the surgical uh, follow-ups and things like that. And adequate support staff always helps us to enhance patient satisfaction also. So this is one way how we regularly plan our expected load and we very closely monitor. For example, for the whole year, we have a diary. This is how we don't have any appointments. So from our diary, we know exactly how many patients we are going to expect on that particular day. This is from the experience of five years, uh, previous year's experience. We, have, we prepare a diary for every day, uh, which calculates the holidays or the special uh, occasions where you may have been lean days and things like that. And this helps in manpower allocation and doing a lot of other activities. And the theater planning is also done like that because the surgeon who sees the patient preoperatively may not operate the next day. So entirely a different set of surgeons will be. So they, there's a lot of scheduling which happens uh, on the number of uh, uh, staff required and also the equipment required and also a lot of uh, work goes into supplies and spares for the uh, procedures. And uh, we make sure that we ensure that the resources match the workload. So we have a lot of volume, then we make sure some of the senior surgeons who can do real high volume go on that particular day to clear off the list. And then we also try to group the cataracts, uh, which I'll show you a little bit later on how we can assure quality. And uh, the systems and processes are perfectly designed to get the results. Um, like this, this uh, video essentially shows you uh, how we have an assembly line and approach uh, of uh, giving a care wherever it is. So this shows you uh, a set of patients who are coming from eye camps uh, in the night. So normally we do eye camps on weekends, on Fridays and Saturdays when they come late in the night at around 7, 8 o'clock. And after that, every test are done on them, like me measuring their biometry, their intraocular lens power, checking their uh, eye pressures, their blood pressures, blood sugars. So all these done are by cycle. And you can see another girl assisting uh, the nurse. So they are the trainees who are undergoing training. So every uh, uh, part of it, no, they, are, they are really uh, involved in the training on the field. So they learn from the senior nurses and the doctors there, like, you, like what you see here. And after the night preparation, the next day morning, uh, you can see them seated like this in the anesthesia room where they are given uh, uh, anesthesia depending on the need. It's a, either a peribulba or topical. So, so every step is done by a girl. So somebody drapes the patient, somebody puts the shoes on, the caps on for them to go inside, and somebody talks to them about the injection, and then the ophthalmologists, where they are needed, they come in and give the injections, and then they leave. But the rest of the things are done by this uh, set of paramedics. So, so these are girls who are called the running nurses. No, they, they do the running kind of job, bring the patient, put the patient on the table, and prepare the next case, and write the notes for me. Because the notes are all so very well planned, it's all ticking, unless you have a complication wherein a surgeon has to add on a note to it. But uh, otherwise, so this, these girls are called the uh, scrub nurses who, who you see them assisting. So by the time a surgeon can complete a case in the neighboring table, so it's kind of an orchestrated system. So he, she exactly knows when to prepare the next patient. So when you remove the lens, the patient is draped. When you are doing a cortex wash, they apply the speculum. When you are implanting a lens, then they do the next step. So by the time you finish this case, the next case is prepped, and then you just move on with your microscope. Uh, you use a, a antiseptic over your gloved hands, and then you, you go on with the next case. And then the patient who has uh, completed the surgery 
uh, walks off uh, from the operating room. So this is just to show you an assembly line what happens in a high volume system. But basically to do this, we need to do a lot of planning before. This is what I was telling you. We group the cataracts depending upon the density and the nature of the cataract. If it's a complex case, we group it as group two. If it needs real attention from a senior surgeon, then it is grouped as group three so that uh, we don't have any problems interoperatively uh, by, by somebody now scheduling a patient to a junior surgeon who is a novice surgeon who doesn't know how to operate some of these complex cases. So everywhere like this, we have protocol so that depending upon the protocol, they are designated to a particular uh, surgeon or a physician who, is, who has mastered that particular technique. So this again shows you the two table system, basically how it has transformed our, the way we uh, do. Uh, this is what you normally see in every, any uh, system when you have one table and one nurse assisting. Uh, even if you give enough number of surgical steps, still the output uh, can be maximum one or two cases an hour. But by increasing the number of tables, the people, the number of people who assist the surgeon, and by increasing the surgical sets, now we can consistently do a higher volume. Because the skills are already there. It's only the efficiency in the system which matters now. So once we can bring in that efficiency, we are able to achieve a real good high volume surgery uh, uh, in, in, in whatever procedure we do. Like for example, uh, ophthalmologists here will, will be knowing of phaco emulsification. An average surgeon would do four to five phacos an hour, and a good surgeon can comfortably do eight phaco surgeries an hour back at home. And the other technique we do is the small incision technique. Some good surgeons can do even 14, 15 small incision in an hour time. So you can finish off a list of 50, 60 you know, by, by lunchtime, and then uh, the whole list of 300, 400 would be over uh, by late afternoon. So we, for doing this kind of a high volume, you now we really have a very good training program, uh, which, which starts from uh, the residency when they are, and they are joining our institute. We have uh, a kind of systematic training program. We do a lot of Oscar scoring on them. You now it's basically uh, score however, I mean, how they are doing the technique at every step. So it starts with a wet lab practice like that. You now we have simulations, we have uh, uh, animal wet labs, you know, where they can practice different surgical procedures comfortably, and then they gradually move on to do on the human eyes when they are confident. And we are, they achieve a very good quality at the end of even their first year of training. So by second year, they become high volume surgeons. And third year of their residency, they really be a part of uh, uh, my uh, uh, team, which can do very good volume at a good quality as well. Just to show you, this is a published uh, data which I'm showing you, the productivity of an eye surgeon. Uh, at India, it is close to three, 350 uh, surgeries in a year. Uh, but in, in, uh, uh, back uh, at our institute, any uh, surgeon would do a minimum of 2,000 and do a maximum of 3,000 plus surgeries in a year. So his, this productivity is basically because of uh, the systems in place and uh, the efficiency which you bring into the system to consistently uh, do this over the years. Just to show you again uh, evidence which we gave some time back on the complications, and I'm just trying to compare with uh, the national level complications on the other side. With the, you know, ophthalmologists here would know the most common complications is the posterior capsular rupture, uh, which is around uh, less than 1% uh, at Aravind, and uh, the, most of them achieve a very good uh, corrected vision. And the endophthalmitis, which the infection which we are all worried about, now we have several uh, evidence to show that in our two table and then scrubbing the hands in between with antiseptic and using a lot of reusables again after autoclavic and gas sterilization, we found an endophthalmite of 0 0.04, which is equivalent to any international standards. This is one thing, now this is a good, uh, interesting picture I always would like to share. There is a kind of blend of high tech and low tech. If you see, they're all normal tables, they are not motorized rooms, you don't have fancy lights on top, but wherever technology is needed, you know, the best FACO machine in the world, the best microscopes in the world, and uh, 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 the monitors which you need to take care of patients' uh, systemic issues. So where we need high tech, we have put high tech, and if you see this is, we call it as a five cent airway. So this is a small clip which you use for drying clothes. 
which is connected to the uh, microscope. We use the, uh, the badges, which you use it for conference. When you go back, I recycle this for this purpose. <laughs> so you put a small, uh, so that's, that gives a very good airway to the patient. Now, these, these are one thing which patient is really worried. If, you don't, if they, they don't get a good airway, they're a little worried also, and uh, that uh, increases the panic level also sometimes. So things like that, you now we keep uh, doing some incremental innovations, and we practice it across our system. And we also make sure that you know, all of our instruments work properly at any given point of time. So we have a set of people, in-house trained engineers by uh, experts from the companies. So we call them instrument technicians who take care of all these equipments. And their basic mission or vision is to kind of uh, see that the, there is no breakdown of any equipment. So they do a lot of preventive maintenance. Say they do it on a Sunday or on a lean days. They go and see that. The microscopes are oiled, they have, their motor, motor is functioning well, and they do all the bulb changing, and they also produce sometimes very cost-effective bulbs, bulbs, and they do a lot of innovations around maintaining these equipment so that there is no breakdown. And we keep uh, regularly monitoring our surgical supplies. Uh, uh, we do periodic quality checks. And uh, if we rely a good source, then we make sure to buy in the same source. And we build a very good relationship over the years with the manufacturers and vendors. So we have a lot of say in the Indian market in the meaning. You no, know, the, some of these people have a very good market. If Aravind uses it, you no, know, many of the ophthalmologists in the country would love to use it. So we have a very strong relationship so that our services and other things are taken care really well. So when, I, when, I was, when I'm talking about lenses and the spares, uh, uh, some of the equipments, because they are so expensive, you cannot use it on people who cannot afford for it. So that was one reason for this backward integration of creating a lab on our own set. So we call this as the Auto Lab, which started uh, uh, two decades back to manufacture uh, intraocular lens, uh, mainly to produce uh, quality products uh, so that we can provide them at an affordable cost and uh, 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 to support our mission to avoid uh, blindness. So, so they started making manufacturing lenses, but now from lenses, uh, they, are, they are manufacturing sutures. Uh, uh, they are focused on orphan drugs in their pharmaceutical division. They make knives, and uh, now also they make instruments like uh, green lasers and red lasers, which are needed for diabetic retinopathy, and they ma manufacture tubes and shunts for glaucoma, which are ridiculously expensive in, uh, in the other parts of the world at a, at a really a low cost. And many of these have CE approval, and they export to 120 countries across the globe. And even in Europe, you, there are several countries who use Aurolab uh, stuff on a regular basis, including the lenses and uh, the shunt procedures, which we uh, are, are uh, quite uh, expensive uh, elsewhere. The other thing which uh, I wanted to stress is on uh, measures and metrics. So I think it's very important, like manufacturing the metrics that actually matter to us. So we keep looking uh, very closely, which really matters to us. Uh, so it's often said that what gets measured gets done. So manufacturing metrics and measures are not as simple as it may appear sometimes. So we try to identify the most important metrics and help the team in decision making. And we monitor these measures and metrics to ensure uh, uh, kind of compliance also to that uh, uh, particular job. So this is one thing which uh, we do on a regular basis. This is basically showing you the different departments, how many patients had reg registered, how many patients have been disposed at a, a particular time. For example, we are, we are regularly seeing the waiting time. So uh, we would like to benchmark saying that in a general units, you no know, people wa should not be waiting more than two hours. Uh, at least 80% of them should be disposed within two hours. So, so like, for example, you can, we have achieved 78% on that day. We are happy. So for glaucoma retina, we would expect somebody you know, to do at least 50% within two hours or three hours, and then the other 50%, because they need some several other investigations to be completed. So this is one thing which is monitored live, uh, minute by minute, and, uh, and it is tracked by the managers. And then the feedback is given to the consultants if there is a waiting time longer. And uh, what we did was we put these monitors into the uh, units you know, where the patients are being examined. So on a live display, they can see how many patients are waiting, more than 90 minutes, total patients waiting in their unit and the other units, you know, which are parallelly running at the same time, and how many patients they have seen per hour. 
So all this gives you a kind of you know, orientation towards patient care so that unnecessarily they, they are not waiting and so they can call for them or they can look for them, what is happening. And, uh, uh, and every month uh, we, we generate reports and we send them to the department heads so that they know exactly how the department is performing in uh, the waiting time. And the other important thing, because we do a very high volume cataract surgery, we have a very good metrics to really see what happens to our cataract surgery patients. So we have all the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative data entered into the system for the 280,000 to 300,000 cataracts we do every year. And we critically analyze the reports like this. Like, like every surgeon, you can see uh, you can select a month, or you can select three months, six months, and see what's happening, how many surgeries you have done, how many you have done under topical anesthesia, how many you have done under retrobulbar anesthesia, what are the intraoperative complications you had, postoperative complications, how was the visual outcome at the end of uh, uh, four weeks, the uncorrected, best corrected. You can benchmark yourself with the best surgeon in the, uh, the, the same facility you're working, like I can benchmark with another surgeon in Pondicherry or with the best surgeon across Arvind. You can compare between the two uh, Arvind Eye hospitals. So you get a lot of uh, evidence from this program. So some individuals and hospitals' performance can be compared against the overall performance. And it also shows the data of the best performing hospital or the individual. And it helps to internally benchmark among our own colleagues. And it has helped to reduce uh, a lot of uh, complications also when they are doing uh, some of them. So this, this basically shows you one surgeon's report, how it is generated. Uh, it shows the number of FACO surgeries is 85%. And then the intraoperative complications is 0.18. And then your immediate uh, post-op vision, you know, many of them achieved a good uh, uh, best corrected and an uncorrected vision. And any infection in his cases, all that can be generated and, he, and it can be sent to him on a monthly basis or on a six month basis so that they keep improving on their metrics. <clears throat> So overall, it has not only helped an individual, it has helped the whole system in improving a lot of things. For example, we had one hospital doing very well in their uncorrected vision, and we looked into their data to find out that they were using a different biometry method called the immersion biometry, which was more accurate. So all the hospitals moved to the immersion method so that we can also get a good uncorrected vision. And then uh, uh, from uh, uh, the, the anesthesia also, we have changed the way we make incisions. We have changed from between uh, learning from other hospitals within Arvind. And uh, because this is being closely monitored, uh, the surgeons are more conscious of what they are doing. They're trying to improve on their skills and improvise so that they have lesser complications, which uh, at the end of the day uh, results in a better vision and satisfied patients as overall. So a lot of evidence-based change happens uh, with this uh, big data. And every six months, we have an auditing happening between all of our uh, centers. And a team from a different hospital would come, because many of the times when you work there, you don't really know what is going wrong in, wrong in your system. So a team from the other Arvind, including the chief medical officer, the nursing superintendent, they come here. They sit with us for three to four days. And we have a program like this. Every department has to present for a couple of hours what they did in that six months, including their patient volume their research, their uh, outreach activities, their clinical activities, their teaching activities. And then uh, they are critically analyzed. And then a feedback is given to the chief of the hospital. And, uh, of, and, and also a lot of innovations between the hospital is shared during these meetings so that overall we can improve the patient care. And the other uh, important thing which we keep on focusing is on bringing in incremental innovations. And also some of the frugal innovations has happened over the years in my uh, being there for 20 years, I've seen a lot of frugal innovations also. So everyone is looking for uh, new ideas uh, to deepen the market. So this is one thing which we have done a decade back of creating vision centers. So we are doing these outreach camps, but uh, uh, fortunately, we were able to demand, generate a lot of demand through these outreach work. But the quality was not up to the mark, in the meaning these eye camps had limited equipments, limited time where you have to see a lot of patients. So we thought we should go for a permanent facility uh, which is a low-cost eye care to reach the unreached. So we aim to provide primary eye care and referral services to these patients. And it is manned by a trained uh, technician. So there are two nurses who run that centers. So these two girls, one is an optometrist and another is a counselor. The counselor takes care of the electronic medical record and the optometrist does the optometry and clinical examination and a teleconsultation is done with the base hospital ophthalmologist, and the patients are given treatment there. So 
what we have seen is over the years, 90% of the problems can be taken care in these vision centers. And only 10% needs referral to the base hospital, like giving a glasses, removing a foreign body, or treating a red eye. All that happens in the vision center, and uh, people needing a cataract surgery or somebody who needs a, a retinal or a glaucoma evaluation is referred to the base hospital. So this is what happens in uh, a vision center. The patients register, all the details are entered into an electronic medical record, and then the optometrist does the basic examination, uh, refraction, and checking the pressure, and then uh, uh, a, a consultation happens with the, uh, uh, with the ophthalmologist in the base hospital uh, through a very good broadband connectivity which we have in semi-urban and rural areas also. So the prescription goes online. The glass prescription, medical prescription goes online, signed by an ophthalmologist to take care of the legal aspects also, and whenever the patient needs any specialty referral, they are referred to the base, nearest base hospital. And within the uh, center, they dispense glasses, so they have few options which are less expensive, and also medications which are really needed for the patients is available in the vision center. So the basic idea is to reduce their time to visit the nearest big hospital, because in India, their culture is to go with one or two people again. So there is a lot of cost involved in travel, in the food when you are traveling, and also the consultation fees and the, and, uh, the transport thing. So all this is taken care of by the vision centers from 10 centers 10 years, 10 years back. Now we have 60 centers across Tamil Nadu, but our audacious goal is to have 200 uh, centers by the year 2025 so that we can totally stop our outreach ICAMS. So this is a blog which was written recently by a prof from London Business School. She said, at, at, uh, everyone at Arvind is constantly looking for ways to improve their service delivery, be it through incremental changes or radical ideas. And if they are not sure if something will work, they just try it out in a safe way. How many medical organizations can you think of that get their innovations from junior service staff? So we really look into ideas from wherever corners it comes from, from our own medical team, from the MLO piece, the mid-level ophthalmic personnel, from the, uh, the junior trainees, wherever the ideas come from, we, we seriously look into their ideas, we practice it very safely, and if it works, we take it to the next level. And again, uh, finally, I think I'll, I'll end with this when I, I briefly on safety and satisfaction. Uh, building a culture is very important. We have tried to build a culture in, into our system. Uh, we are trying to engage both the patient as well as our staff. Like, so this is, this is one poster which you see in all the operating rooms of Arvind. It says the four C's of surgery at Arvind. You make sure you are on the correct eye, you are on the correct IOL power and design, you, are on, you, are, you have taken a correct concern from the patient, and also no, you, are, you are treating the right patient. So take a time out and these kind of posters wherever we need and uh, we try to engage them. We have regular workshops and during the training period itself we try to imbibe this kind of uh, safety culture into them because the number of interactions in our system is really very high. You can see somewhere between uh, 15 interactions happens in a patient at different levels from registration to the final examination. So at every level sometimes we have to see that you're having the correct case record and the correct patient with you. So every time they ask for the patient, what is your name, sir, and where are you from? So at least two identifiers are used at every step so that uh, uh, we don't make any mistake there. So we try to re redefine our safety goals for eye hospitals, and uh, we are trying to work with other eye hospitals also. Basically, again, these are the main primary goals, seeing that you know, you're doing the right patient and the eye and the procedure, the correct because most of them are cataract surgeries, the correct power and the implant is very important, and prevent any morbidity you know, uh, for systemic conditions during an eye surgery, and it goes on to give a good follow-up of high-risk ophthalmic patients using that E1, E2 category, which I uh, briefly told you in the beginning. So we have an online reporting system, so whenever there is a near miss or an error, wherever the department is, so they have to fill in this uh, incident reporting form, and uh, the, you don't have to, uh, the person need not reveal who he is, but which department, what happened, and what was the corrective action, and whether it needs an expert advice or things like that. So immediately an email is generated to my email. I just got a couple of reports today, uh, fortunately not uh, uh, incidents, but near misses. So, so immediately, wherever the attention is there, uh, from the senior side, we react immediately, or else we discuss at the end of a week or a month, depending upon the seriousness of the issue. And the regular patient surveys, again, uh, technology is now used. So we have people regularly going to the inpatient and outpatient facility to see you know, how they feel and what are the improvement we can bring in. And, uh, and again, this is also shared with all of our medical team and uh, our chief medical officers so that you know, they constantly know uh, where they need to improve. And most importantly, we, we look for 
ideas from everywhere, including patients. So this is one interesting idea came from this gentleman. So he said, I bring my wife who is disabled, and whenever I'm wheeling her in, inside your hospital, no, in India, uh, people are not very conscious of how they walk in corridors. So some, sometimes there may be four or five people walking and blocking the way. So uh, he said, uh, uh, why don't you put a small bell like a you know, buggy in the airport uh, uh, vehicle? So this bell, I can ring it so that they'll give me a way to mobilize the wheelchair. So, so we did that for him. He was so happy. Uh, he wrote another uh, uh, letter to me saying that I'm happy that you took my suggestion very seriously and you're practicing it. And now this system is there across all the Aravind. So we started in Pondicherry and now we shared this with all the Aravind and uh, every wheelchair in Aravind has got a bell now. So if somebody visits any of the Aravind, you can make sure that they have a bell. If not, you can tell that uh, Dr. Venktesh made a presentation on that. <laughs> so a lot of group discussion happens with the patient because the volume is so high. We have people in Vision Center. We have people walking into the base hospital. We have people walking through the free hospital and different outreach. So what we do is we take a homogeneous group and we sit with them and it is audio recorded. And then we share this audio with the extended medical team, uh, especially the nurses. We share these audios. And in, in Vision Center, again, because it's located in a remote location, we do telephonic interview. Once in a month, we talk with them. Uh, uh, we randomly select few patients who have registered into vision centers. We talk with them. We have a, a survey question done on them, and then the report is sent to the chief medical officer to see which vision center, where they are not comfortable. Uh, it may be uh, dispensing the glasses or medication or the teleconnectivity, where we are going wrong, and we try to rectify it by these kind of uh, patient group discussions. Uh, but uh, basically, I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll finish by stressing, uh, saying that you know, the all the systems, what we have, it can align the activities towards the goal and coordinates the utilization of uh, resources efficiently. But most importantly, I think uh, the culture which aligns the people towards the goal, the thought process in developing systems and in their continuous refinement. And uh, once again, I thank uh, NHS Scotland for giving us this opportunity to present the Arvind model in front of you. Thank you again. So I uh, heard this talk on a version of it about 18 months ago, and I didn't believe it. I didn't believe they had the highest productivity, the highest quality in the world, and they had linked those two things together. So I went to see it. And in January uh, last year, I had the privilege of uh, Dr. Venkatesh showing me this in the real world, and it's true. I can tell you it's true. And the Golden Jubilee, who some of whom are here and are hosting Dr. Venkatesh for a couple of days, have been as well and seen it. So expect this to come to a hospital near you relatively soon, or bits of it, perhaps. And we wanted to mark this occasion by giving you uh, a gift. You've come a long way. You've come further than anybody else in the building. We really are privileged that you've been able to spend some time with us, and we genuinely thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.